Hey there, health coaches. Does it ever feel like you're just wasting hours and hours and hours of your life on social media? I know, I know the feeling. All the so-called experts tell you that it is a must for building your business. But the question today is, does it really work or is it a waste of your time? My name is Michelle Fenickhaus. I'm a certified health coach with my own private practice as well as acting as a mentor for my fellow health coaches, and I've been doing this for 10 years. Now, usually we live stream these Q&As, but today I just could not get the Facebook live stream to work, which is kind of ironic since we're talking about social media. So anyway, you should always have a backup plan. That's my tip number one. But go ahead and if you're watching this video later, give a like if you would like to be getting better results from using social media and tell me in the comments, what's your favorite social media platform? Today's episode is brought to you by my free training for health coaches. It's called How to Double Your Mailing List in the Next 90 Days. And guess what? Social media is actually pretty important here. It can really help you out with list building. You can sign up for this free training at healthcoachpower.com slash double. Just head on over there, sign up, and the training is all yours. Okay, so on to today's main topic. This one came from Sarah, and Sarah said, what type of return are you seeing from increasing followers on Instagram and Facebook? I'm finding Instagram takes lots of time with frustrating ups and downs and followers, and I haven't done much with Facebook yet. My clients have all been referrals, and I'm wondering if it's a poor use of my time working in Instagram or whether anyone is seeing short or long-term return or long-term returns in adding clients through this media stream. I thought it was a really smart question, Sarah. We always should be sort of auditing how we're spending the time in our day. We only have X number of hours to work. And if you feel like you're wasting half of it on social media, my goodness, let's do something else. So I just want to talk a little bit about how social media works for me and my business, how I see it working for others, and kind of how you can know whether or not it's working for you. So what I initially thought would happen with my business when I opened up my Instagram account or when I started using Facebook for business or whatever is I thought I was going to find clients, right? And this is actually rarely the case that there's going to be a direct client acquisition where like you come across a brand new person that you've never met before. They've never met you, but you find each other via social media and then they contact you for a consultation and boom, sign up and you got yourself a new client. That is, I'm just gonna say, rare. So if that's not happening for you guys, don't worry, it doesn't usually happen that way. Much more often, what I find to be the case, sort of whether you have met someone in person, like at a workshop that you give, or maybe it's a friend or an acquaintance or somebody that you've met in real life, or maybe you have met someone online, regardless of how you met the people, I find that more often social media is a way of nurturing these existing connections. And we have the ability to nurture these relationships across multiple channels. We can reach people on Facebook. We can reach people on Facebook Live when it's working. We can reach people on Instagram. We can reach them on Pinterest. We can reach them on Snapchat or whatever you're using. And that's really great because I don't know if you've noticed, but people have very small attention spans, very small windows that they're going to give you of their time. So if you are only reaching people through your email each week, say you're sending out an email to your list like clockwork every week. I mean, that is great right there. That is a really great thing to be doing. And we talked about email marketing in a recent past episode. But if that's the only way that you're reaching your audience, some people you're just never going to reach because their inbox is so full they never get to read yours or because they just automatically delete everything without opening it or because they're just so busy that they miss it. But later on when they're sitting on the toilet scrolling through Instagram, that may be when they actually catch you. And how amazing is that? 
So I find that the more channels we can be present on, the more likely we are to actually maintain a relationship with those who we have a relationship already. Um, so that's kind of the way that I think about social media. It's like, yes, I am acquiring new people into my world, but more importantly, it's, it acts as a way for me to build those relationships. And um, either way, however you find these people, however you're nurturing them, whatever platform you're on, whether your favorite is Instagram or Facebook or whatever, the most important thing that you can do is always be spending time on these platforms with an eye towards converting your fans and your followers to your own mailing list. And I talk a lot about this inside my course, Healthy Profit University, because I find that time on social media can be wasted, wasted, wasted time if you don't have a, a strategy in mind. And what often works really well is to have someone that you are talking with, you're commenting on, they're commenting on your stuff, you know, whatever, you're showing up in their feed. If you can get that person onto your mailing list, well, that's great, because now that's another touch point you have with them, but also people are more likely to buy from email than they are likely to buy directly from social media. This varies a little bit from demographic to demographic, but you know, there is a saying for a reason, the money is in the list. So I always use social media as a way to gather my audience and convert them over to my mailing list. And finally, Sarah, <laughs> and for anybody else wondering, some people just hate social media. They don't want any part of it. Yeah, you know what? People had successful businesses long before the advent of social media. I had a successful business I'm not gonna say long before the advent because I suppose it had already been, been invented in a way, but 10 years ago, we were not using social media the way that we're using it today. I was hardly using it at all for my business. And yet, I earned money. My peers were earning money. We were all running businesses and we did it without Instagram at all. So no, it's not necessary. And Particularly if you plan on being more of a local business that gets lots of referrals, if you're going to be out in your community, community events, you're going to be really working the local scene, maybe you have an office on Main Street, whatever it is, that really, I think, makes it less important for you to be active on social media. You're going to be putting your efforts elsewhere. You know, you're going to be showing up for the street fair. You're going to be working on building uh, relationships with all of the other practitioners and business owners on up and down Main Street or wherever you are. However, if you're looking to compete in the online space, if you want to be working with clients worldwide like I do, then yes, social media is something that you may want to invest your time in. But as we talked about, don't measure your success on how many consultations came in today through Instagram. It just doesn't really work that way. So I hope that's helpful, Sarah. And for anybody else that has been struggling with social media, if you know what you're doing, you have a strategy for how you're using it, I find that the time is better spent and you don't feel like, oh my God, what am I doing? Just posting another picture of what I ate for breakfast this morning. Okay, let's move on to another question. And this one comes from Kayla. Kayla said, I'm wondering how all of you created your terms and conditions page on your website, along with the privacy policy. I need to create it and link it to my website, but I'm not sure where to start. Great question, Kayla. I'm gonna tell you guys a funny story. So when I started my business, I didn't have any of this stuff and I didn't even know I needed it. So you're way ahead of me, Kayla. I had never even heard of a privacy policy. But one day I was looking at somebody else's website, another health coach, and she had these pages. She had terms and conditions, she had all this stuff. And so I went onto her page and I copied it and I pasted it and I decided that's what I was gonna use too because hers looked pretty official. How 
dumb is that? First of all, the pages are really long. I mean, legal documents, legal things tend to be super wordy, right? So there could have been mentions of her business in there a zillion times that I didn't even catch to change and make into my own business name. Not to mention she probably had this stuff drafted by a lawyer or has been in somehow modified to fit her business. And here I am, I'm going to use it for mine. So that was definitely an amateur move on my part. Kayla, I want to tell you what I had actually recently done to up my game in the legal areas of business. Definitely not my area of expertise. I am no lawyer, in case you couldn't already tell. But there is um, a, an attorney and legal coach. Her name is Lisa Fraley, and she's actually going to be joining us next week. So on December 13th, 2018, Lisa's going to be joining us for an event to talk about how to practice legally, no matter where you live in the United States. We get so many questions about this. And part of that is going to be having the right legal documents completed for your business and available on your website. So first of all, please join us for that event. You can sign up by going to findyourbalancehealth.com slash legal event. And she's going to give you a lot more information there. I'm sh um, and the reason that she's the perfect person to talk to about this stuff is because I use Lisa and her resources to create the terms and conditions for my brand new website, um, privacy policy, a couple other things that I've been using. I don't forget what they're called right now. Did I mention that I'm not a lawyer? But uh, she has a whole list of things that you may need for your business. And she has done for you templates that you can buy and she walks you through how to fill them in so that they work for you and your specific business, which is pretty awesome because then you're not paying a lawyer an hourly fee to create this stuff for you. It's pretty routine documents. So they're sort of done for you and I found them easy to complete. Um, she'll be talking more about those at the webinar. I'm sure that's going to come up, but if you want to take a look at what she has right away and if you missed the webinar because you're listening to this later, Check out Lisa Fraley's stuff. Um, you can go to findyourbalancehealth.com slash legal, and that'll take you to all of her done-for-you templates uh, for terms and conditions, privacy policy, and that sort of thing for your website, Kayla. Good luck. Okay, I got another question here from Michelle, and she said, I want to have one website that would be for the general public that can look at my services and see what I'm all about. I also want to have a website that would be member access only where they would pay a fee monthly to be part of it. Is that something I could do for my regular website with some sort of login criteria? Or is that something I would need to do separately on a different site? Well, again, I have some funny stories. A lot of these things are questions that I've asked myself through the years. And since I didn't have anybody to really ask other than myself, I often came up with some very strange solutions, <laughs> as I mentioned, with my terms and conditions page. So Michelle, um, I thought I would just share with you some of my experiences. The answer is there's a zillion ways to do this. There really are lots of different solutions for how you can have a member site with login access in addition to your own website, if we were having a one-on-one -on -one conversation, I would want to know more about this member site because it is a big investment of your time and energy, not to mention any money that you might spend um, to maintain something like that. And you want to make sure you're going into it with a strong strategy for success. But anyway, I will leave that for another conversation. The first time that I wanted to have a true login, sort of member-only access on a website was actually for a course that I used to run for health coaches. Um, it was a, sort of a, a beginner course, and I needed somewhere to put my videos and my worksheets, and I, was, I wanted to have a true member site. So at that time, what I did was I bought a WordPress plugin, and there's lots of these out there. The one I bought is no longer around for good reason. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm sure you can find others. So if you're on WordPress in particular, I know there's lots of plugins that do member access type functionality. Um, and if you're on Wix or you're on Squarespace, my understanding is they may have this type of functionality as well. And so that's what I did. And it worked. It worked okay. But 
what I didn't love about using my own website and my server for my member site was that it just made the back end of my website so much more complicated. And when one thing goes down, everything goes down. And that will happen with websites, right? Sometimes the website goes down. Sometimes the server crashes. I know a very well-known and lucrative, uh, profitable, lucrative, like, you know, very successful, what am I trying to say, health coach. And she had her entire business shut down one day because of a mistake that an assistant made. And the whole site went down, not just her website, but her member site, her sales pages. She couldn't make any money. She was running ads to pages that weren't there. She had members that couldn't access their stuff. It all went down in one big fire. And that's what I'm talking about. It can be a little bit tricky to kind of put all your eggs into one basket. So I stopped using that plugin because it didn't have some functionality that I needed. But even if that hadn't happened, in retrospect, I can see that it's, I, I like how my business is set up now where I actually have a website that sits on one server. I have a member site that is hosted by a completely different company. I'll tell you about that in just a second. And actually all of my sales pages are lead pages and are hosted on lead pages. So my website could go down. I could make a mistake and erase my whole website. And I have done that in the past, you guys. And I could still be making sales because my sales pages live somewhere else and my members could still be accessing their lessons. So what I've been using lately is a membership site called Thinkific. And if you want to check it out, you can go to findyourbalancehealth.com slash think. It's a site that allows course creators to put up any kind of course that they want. I think it has a really nice design. It's easy to use. It has a ton of features and integrations, and it's not terribly expensive. I thought that the way they have their membership breakdown made a lot of sense. Some of the others seemed way, way, way more expensive than anything that I want to, wanted to pay for. So I've been very happy with Thinkific. You might want to look into that. And at the very least, do look around for options where you can host your member site separately. <laughs> and uh, just, to po just to go back to my point about sales pages, again, I host mine on lead pages. You can get a lead pages account for just a couple of hundred dollars a month. No, not a month, a year, a couple hundred dollars a year. It's not very expensive. And then again, you're not relying on the member site. You're not relying on your own website to make sales. And that can be really handy as well. Lead, uh, lead pages you can find at findyourbalancehealth.com slash lead pages. Alrighty then, <laughs> let's move on. It's funny because usually these Q and A's are live, so I'm taking your questions as they come in. Today, I can't talk to anybody, so I'm just going on the notes that I had prepared in advance. Sorry about that, we will try to get this working again for next week. So here's a question that came in from Rebecca. And I think she posted this right before Thanksgiving. She said, can anybody recommend a few iBooks to listen to while driving? I'm looking for something pertinent to health and wellness. Well, you came to the right place, Rebecca, because we're all a bunch of health and wellness nerds. So I know you got some suggestions for different things to listen to. I have never listened to an iBook in my life. That sounds interesting. I should figure that out someday. But I thought, hey, this is a cool opportunity to just talk about some of the podcasts that I listen to religiously. I tend to be someone that subscribes to a podcast and I like just listen to those podcasts. I don't hop around a lot. I'm very, very you know, connected to the few podcasts that I subscribe to. So these are ones that week after week, they're putting out great content. I maybe don't listen to every single episode, but I always look to see what's their latest and I'm hooked. So the first one that I want to tell you about is called Mastering Nutrition. It's by Chris Masterjohn. And he puts out episodes that are really bite-sized, eight minutes, seven minutes. It's great. And they're very specific little topics like using vitamin A for allergies or knowing your zinc status or something like that. And you can just look at it and know right away if that's something you need or something that you don't and move on. But I love how quick and bite-sized they are lots of great information. Another one in a similar vein 
is The 15-Minute Matrix by Andrea Nakayama. I love this podcast because, again, the episodes are on the shorter side, very succinct, and they cover one specific topic in each episode. And if you're familiar with the functional medicine matrix, that's the idea of each episode is that they map a condition or they map you know, something um, to the matrix, which is just, I just think it's a really interesting, creative way to go about doing a podcast. So I love that one, the 15 minute matrix. I also listen to Natural MD Radio. You may know, I have talked about this before, that I studied with Dr. Aviva Ram last year in her professional training program. So this is Aviva's podcast, Natural MD Radio. And I love listening to this because it works as sort of a refresher for a lot of the things that I learned in her program. It helps me keep it top of mind and maybe understand it in a new way because she's just saying it a little bit differently. Or also on her podcast, she's not getting quite so technical. So on the podcast, often the way she explains something teaches me how I might explain it to somebody else. So I love listening to Aviva's podcast. The only episodes I don't listen to are the ones that are about pregnancy or natural birth. And these are all things that are very relevant to me, not too many years ago, but right now I'm not in that place in my life and neither are my clients. But if you are in the childbearing time of life, definitely check out Aviva's podcast for topics related to that. And then another one, and this is a bit of an outlier because it's not so much about health, but it's, a, it's a more about mental health, I suppose, than emotional health. It's called Over It and On With It with Christine Hassler. Christine Hassler is a life coach, and she's got a great podcast, really well done. She mixes it up. Sometimes it's an episode where she's doing live coaching with a listener. Sometimes it's an episode where she's doing an interview with somebody. It kind of changes, and I've just found that to be always be something worth listening to. So again, that's called Over It and On With It with Christine Hassler. And I'll put links to all of these in the show notes. Alrighty, I think I have time for one more question. And I have this one here. Luckily, I have it here since I'm not getting any questions live today. I always have some prepared though. And this is a good one that came in from Allison. And Allison said, I have a meeting with a potential client today. She's been struggling with her weight since having a partial hysterectomy many years ago. She's tried every diet under the sun and then some. She's even gone to two functional medicine doctors and gotten the whole workup, thyroid, adrenal, hormones, both told her that everything looks fine and she needs to accept her weight. If I had to guess, something is off with her hormones and her metabolism is wrecked from the constant dieting. Where would you go with a client like this? Ah, let's just all take a breath for Allison. Where would we go with a client like this? You know, Allison, it sounds like this client knows a lot, has done a lot. She's probably read a lot of books. She's tried all the diets. She's even gone to two of these functional medicine doctors, and that's not cheap. And now she's working with you. I think it's probably time to step away from protocols. And I would go with this client where she wants to go. Because to me, it sounds like she's been listening to every piece of advice that she can get her hands on. I mean, and that's a good thing, right? She's been really working hard to try to solve her problem. But maybe it's time to turn that around and start paying more attention to what's going on inside of her and what she thinks. And maybe this is a real opportunity to use your time coaching her to explore what does she think is going to help her? Where does she think the problem lies? What would she like to try? What are her frustrations? Like allow her to have her own answers because often our clients do. You can come to them thinking, oh, well, this person needs to supplement with that or they need to get this test. But sometimes if you give them the space, a client will just out and tell you, I really need to sort things out between me and my sister. It's been causing me so much stress. Okay, that sounds important. You know, you never know what's going to come up when you allow somebody to listen to their own intuition. And that to me, that to me is what's going to make the difference for this woman, not another protocol, not another set of supplements or eat this, don't eat that type 
rules. So Allison, I hope, I hope that helps. I hope that helps all of you who are working with clients and you think to yourself, I don't know what to tell them. Just remember, not your job as a health coach to know what to tell them. I'll let that sink in. Not your job to know what to tell them. It is your job to help your clients figure out what they want to do and how to go about it. There you go. I want to thank you all so much for being here. Obviously not watching live, but catching the replay or listening via podcast later. And if you've been getting value from the show and all of the free content that I put out every week, please go ahead and leave a written review on iTunes. I would appreciate that so very much because that's what I need to reach more coaches and keep doing this work. Also, we are now on Instagram, which is fitting considering the topic of this show. So if you go to Instagram.com slash health coach power community, please follow and I'll follow you back. Thanks for being here. Keep asking great questions and I will keep answering them. See you guys next week.